Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to another night of Revelation Today, The Great Reset. We're so glad that you've joined us here live in Chattanooga. Those of you that are watching around the world, we're just so glad that you have chosen to study the Bible with us here. And we have a number of people watching, as we've mentioned, night by night all around the world. And it's kind of fun to just name a few of those each evening, so we like to do that. We have folks watching from Singapore, the country of Singapore, Clinton, Oklahoma, San Diego, California, Warburton, Australia, Costa Rica, Jamaica, and hundreds of other places. So those watching, thank you for joining us each evening. We're very excited to have you with us here. Also, we want to remind you of the website. There you can go and find resources. There are pocketbooks. The pocketbooks are not for every night, but for certain nights, and they'll be available for you to download for free, and you can continue to study more deeply the subjects that we are learning night by night. Also, the Bible study guides are available to you to go through as well. Those will help you understand that night's topic more profoundly. And friends, isn't it exciting how we've been studying the Bible? How many of you have learned something new here tonight? And those of you watching, I'm sure that you've learned new things as well. We've been receiving emails from you, and we appreciate those, and we're doing our best to answer those, your Bible questions and your comments, and we're just so encouraged by the number of folks who are accepting Christ, who are following the Bible truth that they're learning, and they're just overjoyed at that. So thank you. Keep those emails coming. On the website, you're also able to uh, donate if you want to make a donation. We have a store there available that has a number of resources that will be a blessing to you, as well as the Bible questions. Well, we have our upcoming schedule. We've had a few nights off here, but we have some exciting topics coming up. Our next several meetings uh, are going to be talking about American prophecy, the Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast. It is going to be a power-packed next several nights as we dive deep, deep into Bible prophecy. Well, we have a number of Bible questions that we want to answer tonight, so I'm going to invite you to join me in welcoming Pastor John Bradshaw as we answer some Bible questions this evening. Welcome, Pastor John. Thank you, Wes. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. And even better to see you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us, wherever it is you might be. We are going to have a tremendous evening, I believe, and I'm glad you have some questions. Absolutely. So we'll start we there. Absolutely. We have some good ones tonight. Okay. okay. Number one, please explain how Samuel the prophet could come back and speak to Saul if he was sleeping in the grave, referring to the topic on death. It seems like God sent him to give Saul that message because he told Saul the future when he said he would die the next day. Well, uh, Okay, it's, it, it, it seems like. It seems like. If you know the story, King Saul was in a bit of a fix, and he went to see a woman, and uh, she was to tell him the future. But I didn't tell you all of the story, and what, what some people believe is that because the woman apparently communicated with Samuel, who was dead, well, then how could a dead person communicate with the living? Happens all the time, you know. Let me explain this to you. Saul said to his servants in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 7, seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit. In other words, go and find me a, she was a witch. So we shouldn't ascribe to her any, any, uh, anything that indicates that she might have been doing God's work. She wasn't. She was a witch. I mean, a real bona fide, genuine witch. And so they said, there's a woman at Endor. Saul disguised himself, put on other clothing, and he said to the woman, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring him up whom I shall name unto you. This wasn't God working. This was a witch in communication with, uh, well, you can tell me. And so what happened next was the woman said, you know what Saul has done. He's cut off out of the land those that have familiar spirits and wizards and, and so forth. So in other words, you're going to get me in trouble. She said, he said, don't worry about it. And then he said, bring up Samuel. Now, verse 12 says, and when the woman saw Samuel, here's what we already know based on the Bible. The Bible says very clearly that the dead do what? The dead sleep. So it couldn't have been Samuel because Samuel was asleep. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Paul wrote to the Corinthians. David said, I shall be satisfied when I awake 
with your likeness. That's the thread that runs all the way through the Bible. And the person who told the first lie about that was the devil in Genesis chapter 3. Has God said you will not surely die? Oh, don't listen, or you will surely die rather. Don't listen to that, listen to me. So here, this was a seance. The witch was communicating with demons. It says, when the woman saw Samuel, Saul didn't. He was taking the woman's word for it, you see. And so she cried out, you've deceived me. Don't worry about that. What did you see? She said, I saw God's ascending out of the earth. What form is he of? An old man comes up covered with a mantle. Saul perceived it was Samuel. You know something? I used to do a radio program, and one day my program director arranged for me to interview a spirit medium. And while we were sitting in the studio, before the show began, the lights on the switchboard were flashing like lights on a Christmas tree. People were into this stuff. And the woman said to me, there are four men in your life important to you. I see them standing behind you. I couldn't see them. She assured me they were there. She said, four men? I said, I have four brothers. She said, that'll be them. I said, I don't know why, they're all alive. And she didn't have an answer either. You know what she could have said? She could have said, there's a dog. I could say, yeah, my neighbor over the back, he's got this Doberman that chases me. Ha ha, that's the one. You can get pretty lucky, or you can get insight from the devil himself. What happened here, even though it appears that the spirit told the future to uh, King Saul, sure, that's because the devil knew what was about to happen. The devil knew that God had forsaken King Saul. The devil knew that Saul was now in his hands. And basically what he was saying was, I'm going to end your life. So what happened with Saul and Samuel? It wasn't Samuel. This was a seance. This was a spiritist medium communicating with spirits of the dead, not of the dead, spirits of the devil. Demons was, I'm going to say that again. Go for it. (laughs) This wasn't the king communicating with a dead prophet. This was a witch communicating with demons and then relaying messages back for a couple of reasons. One was to torment the king. The devil is like that. And two, to confuse people today. Pretty successful on both counts. But that prophet Samuel wasn't alive, wasn't speaking, wasn't manifesting. He was dead, he was in the grave, and he was asleep. Now we understand it clearly. It says right there that Saul perceived that it was Samuel. He wanted to believe it, so that's what he he chose to believe. He didn't see nothing. It's the woman who saw the, uh, the thing. He wanted to believe it. Number two, please explain the difference between a spirit and a soul. Okay, well... Back at creation, the Bible says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a living being. So a soul is not what you possess. It's not what you have. It doesn't float off from you when you die. A soul is what you are. It is a being in which is the breath of life. Now, that word spirit can be used in several different ways. All the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Job said in Job 27 and verse 3. And so there the spirit is the breath, the life spark. Remember, God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then the man came to life. So there spirit represents breath. It's the, the life spark that makes you go, that makes you run that boots you up when otherwise you would not be up. You'd be very much down. So think of that as the breath of life, the breath of life. That's what the spirit represents there. All right. Number three, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, that when one dies, the spirit will go back to God who gave it. Isn't this evidence that we go to heaven when we die? 100% is evidence that we don't go to heaven when we die. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, it says, it says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And the spirit, that's the breath, 
shall return to God who gave it. So this is not something conscious. It's not something thinking. This is the life spark. It's the breath God put in us. It's, in a certain sense, it's life. When you die, who holds the power to, to enable you to live again? God does. Now, when the Bible says the breath goes back to God, I don't, I don't really think that between here and heaven, there's all these little packets of breath shooting all the way back to so God can place them on a shelf and label them and say, there's Adam Aardvark right there at the front of the queue down here. To, I don't think that's what's happening. It's telling us that God holds your life in his hands. The life spark, the ability to, to raise somebody from the dead and cause that person to live again, God has that. You saw Jesus demonstrate that again and again. There was the dead body of the son of the widow of Nan. Jesus raised him from the dead. The breath went back into him. That power to cause him to live again was manifest and utilized or put into effect by Jesus himself. So that verse there, Ecclesiastes 12 verse seven, is very clear. You go back to the dust, the breath, that, that life spark, God holds that. We don't go to heaven. When you die, you're going to go maybe to a mortuary, then to a funeral parlor, and then perhaps to a crematorium or to a graveyard. That's it. That's it. Until, until Jesus comes back. And on that day, the dead in Christ shall rise. There's going to be a great getting up morning. There will be a great reunion on that day. Jesus comes back, and then the saved live again. Amen. Powerful stuff. Number four, what should I do if, my, if I'm required to work on the Sabbath? How can I be off to honor God when my employer doesn't allow it? Is there any kind of Sabbath work that's permitted? Um, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, God said, them that honor me, I will honor. So it's a good question to ask. And what I would encourage you to do is to settle it in your heart that you will honor God. That's that. God is your employer. God can provide for you. He does provide for you. It says in the Proverbs that it is God who gives you power to get wealth. And that's just the truth. Or maybe that's Deuteronomy. Either way, it's absolutely a truism. So what you want to do if, if you have, i tell you what I did. I was working one day a week. Guess which day it was? Now, I'd love to be able to tell you I was making so much money, that's why I didn't have to work the other six days of the week. No, I was living in London, England, and I was flat, busted, broke, and all I could find was a job working one day a week, and I didn't earn much. And then I read the Bible, and I was profoundly convinced that Jesus was my Lord and Savior. And I thought right then, well, I will honor him. I'll do his will. I'll decide to go his way. What I knew that would mean would be that I would keep the seventh day Sabbath because that's what's in the Bible. And I called my boss and he said, well, thank you for, your, for communicating this to me and I really appreciate your good work. It's been great working with you. See you later. And I thought, well, that, that's that then. That's that then. Now I was unemployed. So I prayed to God and guess what happened? Yes. No, I didn't get nothing, nothing at all. Nothing happened. No, I sweated. That's what happened for about two weeks, which is not long. Then I got a job uh, working uh, six days a week. And then shortly after that, a job earning twice as much working five days a week. You see what happened, right? God honored me. He allowed me to go through a little tight space, but it was okay. And he honored me. Now, very, very frequently, you can speak to your employer and say, this is my spiritual, biblical conviction. This is what I intend to do. What can you do to help me? The law says that the employer must make a reasonable accommodation to assist you if this is your religious conviction. Now, those words, reasonable accommodation, they're up for interpretation, but the vast majority of employers are not willing to jettison good staff. So if you have an issue where you need to work on the Sabbath, communicate that to your boss. Do so kindly, graciously, maybe put it in writing. Uh, offer to work Sunday. Say you'll work in the evening. Say you'll start early because what you want to do is honor God and be the best employee that you can be. So are there some jobs that require Saturday work? Well, no. No, there are not. Now, someone's going to say, well, doctors, well, you could be the doctor who gets the day off if you could, but sometimes that's not possible. And you know, I have, I have a friend who uh, delivers lots and lots of babies, and not once has he ever been successfully able to convince a woman to wait until after the Sabbath 
before he can come and deliver the baby. Not once. So some things you, you just got to do when it's a matter of life and death and, and saving someone or dealing with their health and, and that sort of thing. But the vast majority of jobs, you know, we can afford to, to thank God for allowing us to take the day out, talk to your employer. If it doesn't work well, get back to me and there might be something that I can share with you, perhaps a letter that's been well written. But take this to God, pray about it, be nice about it. And doesn't be help that, if you're a rascal, right? Uh, you, don't want to, you don't want to be obnoxious or belligerent about it. And I know, I know you would never want to be like that. So go to the Lord, then go and talk to that employee. The best thing you know is to honor God. I had a friend, Dennis, the truck driver in Kentucky. And uh, he went to his boss one day and said, you guys want us to falsify the logbook. I won't do that. You're asking me to lie. The boss said, well, then I'll fire you. And he said, well, you'll have to fire me because I won't falsify that logbook. I cannot lie for you. And he was fired. And that was that. Over lying, which is one of the commandments of God as well. So I don't know whether you think he did the right thing or the wrong thing. It was certainly the right thing for him. But when it comes to keeping the Sabbath, it's important to God and it's important to you. So put God first. He will take care of you. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. One last question. Is going to church on the Sabbath part of God's commandment to keep it holy? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. The Bible says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It doesn't say remember to go to church to keep it holy. So you could argue that God does not command that anybody goes to church. But listen, the Sabbath was an holy convocation. It's when God's people got together. If you read about Jesus in Luke 4 and verse 16, it was his custom to go to the Sabbath day. You read in the book of Luke, the early Christians got together on the Sabbath. And so when you read in uh, Hebrews about not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, you would understand that worship is a very, very important part of the Sabbath. It is a worship day. Yes, you can worship God on any day, but this is a day set aside for worshiping God. And so surely then attending church would be part of that. We are part of a body, Christian believers, and it's right to worship corporately and get together and be uh, uh, to, to fellowship on the seventh day Sabbath. So I'm I'm being careful to separate two things. The Bible doesn't command you to go to church on Sabbath. It says keep the Sabbath day holy. That's an offer you shouldn't refuse. And then as part of that, it is logical and right and very, very biblical to be sure to worship on the Sabbath day. You will discover it is a great blessing, and I would encourage you not to miss it. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. Thanks, Wes. We'll continue to answer Bible questions, so please keep submitting those. It isn't exciting to just study the Bible, friends, and get our answers from there. What a thrilling opportunity we have to do so. Tonight, we have a special number that will be presented by Claudia and Roy Treyer, entitled Safe Within Your Arms.
Well, thank you very much. Let us pray and ask God to bless us and speak to us tonight. Let's pray now. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful to be in your presence and we're asking for a special manifestation of your spirit. Lead us in your word, we ask you. I pray that you'd speak to us. No one is here to listen to theories, ideas, or speculations. We're all here to hear from you. Speak to us now, I pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Please say, amen. Back in 1966, Peter spent the princely sum of $300 buying a 1933 Canadian-built McLaughlin Buick Series 80 Victoria Coupe. He was a shop teacher at a technical college, pretty handy sort of a guy, and he had a good idea. He thought, I will restore this car, and just as soon as I can, I get it done quickly, drive it across Canada. It didn't quite work out that way. His plans changed. And once he started working on his 1933 Buick, he realized that he had stumbled across something rare. So he decided that he would take his time and do the job right. And when I say he decided that he would take his time, he really decided to take his time. It took him 33 years to get the restoration job done completely. He made many replacement parts by by hand. He replaced almost all of the wood in the internal frame. The car needed new upholstery, and well, rather than send it off to an upholstery shop, Peter remembered seeing his mother using a sewing machine. He figured... I could do that. And so he got an upholstering machine himself and made all the upholstery on his own. He hand-built a replacement muffler. There were components even in the brakes, components on the inside, things that no one would ever see. Peter wanted it to be, or them, to be just like the original. So he had them plated in copper and cadmium just like the originals were. Again, no one would ever see it, but Peter saw it. And he wanted this car to be absolutely, well, as original as it possibly could be. When he got done, people said to him, so what are you going to do with your car? He said, I haven't got a clue. Put it to one side and went to work on a 1919 PS Arrow that he had bought in New York City. You see, vehicles like these are labors of love. I have a brother-in-law who who, uh, restores cars. He's restored quite a few. They're absolutely magnificent. He'll get up early, he'll work late, he'll work weekends, he'll spend money that, I mean, not vast sums of money, but some people might think he's a little crazy. But aren't they beautiful? I just love seeing old cars. When you see an old car, you see a Duesenberg or something like that. Maybe you see a Nash or a Studebaker. You realize a lot of work went into restoring these vehicles. Often, people will ask the the, the restorers about the process. And one of the questions they will ask is, how much time did you spend restoring that vehicle? What did it take to make that old thing new again? Very similar thing with homes. People will buy old homes, dilapidated homes, fix-it jobs or fix-up jobs, and spend time, and, and before long, man, this thing is just like brand new. It's not new, but it's just like brand new. Even homes that, I don't know, some people might think are beyond help 
with the right amount of time, the right amount of expertise, the right amount of money, that old home can be turned into a gem again. And the whole business of restoring homes, renovating homes, it's a big thing. There are television programs from one side of the television screen to the other dealing with this subject. They're popular, they're very well made, and people love to watch about old homes that have been redone and lovingly and painstakingly restored. Now let's switch gears just a little bit. In World War II, the German city of Dresden was bombed relentlessly by Allied forces. February of 1945, it took place over several days. 25,000 people died. 1,300 aircraft from the United States and Britain were employed. 4,000 tons, that's a lot, of bombs and incendiary devices were dropped on this city. The absolute devastation. And among the destruction was the landmark Frauenkirche, a beautiful old church, which incidentally, or interestingly, was left in ruins for 50 years after the war as a war memorial. But then after German reunification, the church was rebuilt. I've been there and seen it. If you were able to see it, you would say it is stunning. Truly a thing of beauty. Now, if you've been to Paris, you've more than likely seen Notre Dame Cathedral. That's different style, depending on how you assess these things. Certainly very beautiful. Notre Dame, Our Lady, built in honor of Mary, the mother of Jesus. But then, in 2019, a fire devastated the, well, priceless treasure of a building. Restoration is underway. There have been certain forecasts made about when it will be completed. There's been some dickering about, do we remake it just like it was? Do we need to use new materials? Do we need to make it safer? Do we make it better? How do you make it better? Many people say that it's going to take years and years to get it finished. But when it's finished, you can be sure that it will be breathtakingly beautiful. So we restore cars and houses and churches and cathedrals, but... But what about restoring people? It's a very important question. When you get into the Bible, you discover it's a major theme of the Bible. And when you get into the book of Revelation, you see something that's that's really interesting. You see that people have been restored. I'd like to show you. We begin in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, I want you to notice something. What we've talked about so far is cars being restored. We talked about homes being restored and churches and cathedrals being restored. But I want you to know something that God isn't in the business of restoring people. That is, God is not interested in renovating people. What you're going to find God will do, God is going to recreate people. So if this was one of those fix-it home shows, what you do is you wouldn't find the old home and, 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 and I don't know, reskin it and put a new roof on and do new paving and replace the appliances. What you do under the way God does it is you'd blow the whole thing to pieces, you'd scrape the lot absolutely clean, you start again and build something brand new. That's what God does with us. See what the verse says. God loved us, washed us from our sins in the blood of Jesus. God makes us new. He doesn't just improve you, but when it comes to the plan of salvation, it's out with the old, and in with the new. In fact, you get into the book of Revelation, past the the opening chapter, and you get right to the letters to the seven churches. And in each letter to each of the seven churches, you see that there's always a really special promise contained. Let's begin looking at these uh, promises. The first church is Ephesus. And Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He is saying to the people of that church, I'm going to get you out of this world and absolutely into the world to come. 
What does he say to the church of Smyrna, the second church? Revelation 2, verse 11. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. When does that take place? At the end of the millennium, when fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours or destroys the lost, the wicked. But God says, not my people. They will not be hurt by that. Okay, third church is the church of Pergamos. And here, Jesus says, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I'll give him a white stone, and on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. A new name, a new experience, a new mind. You see, God intends to make you new. The church of Thyatira, Jesus said, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. These are extravagant promises being made by God to people that absolutely you can see God designs will be new, remade, and will live forever. You know, we got a new roof on our home one time, and the guy's like, well, do you want a 15-year roof or a 30-year roof or what kind of roof you want? I, I kind of want a roof to last about as long as me or maybe even longer. It'd be good if they would just say, this roof will last you forever. Unfortunately, there's no such roof. God does not give you the 15-year, the 30-year, or even the 100-year option. He says, if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you get the eternal option in the new recreated you. Over in Revelation chapter 3, in the letter to the church at Sardis, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. That's the righteousness of Christ. I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Very clearly, some names will be blotted out of the book of life. People who professed Jesus but did not follow through with their profession and turned and walked away. God says your name will be in the book of life for ever when you've accepted Jesus and you hang on to Jesus. To the church of Philadelphia, Jesus says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Big promises. And to the last day church, the church of Laodicea, Jesus says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So what you've got to see in the book of Revelation, interestingly, a book that some people stay away from because they find it scary and difficult to understand and hard to get through and inaccessible. Right here, you've got the God of heaven telling people my intent is to make you new so that you live forever, that you inhabit eternity, and that you and God together will reign and enjoy and you will grow and the future will never have any end. After you've been in heaven a million years, you will be no closer to the end of your future than when you began. Remarkable. In Revelation 7 and verse 4, uh, people are called the servants of God, the 144,000. You see them again in Revelation 14 and verse 1. I want you to see what it says. I looked and behold, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads, special group of people alive on the earth, ready to meet Jesus when he comes back. They've had a new experience. They've been given a new mind. No, don't worry. You will not have Jehovah tattooed on your forehead throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. This is God saying, I give you a new mind. And your mind and God's mind are going to be one. They're going to be joined. They're going to be reun or united. Powerful stuff. Later in the same chapter, here is the patience of the saints, the saved. You see, Revelation is all about a redeemed people, a recreated people. In Revelation chapter 15, God sees those who've got the victory over the beast, over his image, and over the mark of his name. Christ depicts them as standing on the sea of glass. 
Revelation 18, the earth is illuminated with a manifestation of the character of Christ as seen in the people of Christ. Revelation 19, the second coming of Jesus. Christ is coming back to save his people. Revelation 20, the saints live and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. And after that, we come back to an earth made new Incredible. Revelation chapters 21 and 22, you see a new heaven and a new earth, and the saved are with Jesus and will be forever. Revelation 22, 3, there will be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will serve Him forever. So you're not going to be like an old car that's been fitted out to look new again. You will be remade, recreated, and eternity will stretch on with you inhabiting it forever and ever and ever. The objective of the prophecies of the Bible is to show us Jesus as Savior and Lord, to convince you that this earth is not your home, that there is something better stretching before you, that God will forgive you and make you into a new you. If you see beasts, okay, but what do they teach you about Jesus and salvation? If you see plagues and thunders and trumpets and this and that, okay, but too many people stay there without following on to know the Lord. The Bible is intent on encouraging you to know that God's intent for you is eternity, life without end. So, so what sort of new you are we talking about when we talk about a new person? You talk to people about change and they typically will discuss self-improvement, involve them that might be meditation, confronting your fears, controlling your emotions. How's that working out, I wonder? I mean no harm when I share this with you, but more people are medicated now than ever before. Now, if medication's necessary, then it is. I would advise you or anyone to take every drug you need to take. You heard what I said. But that's not the point. The point isn't, is a person sick and does a person need medication? The question I'm asking is, can Americans really be in such bad shape that we need to consume as much medication as we do? Could that be possible? Two out of three adults in America use prescription drugs. Two out of three. How could we be in such bad shape? More Americans than ever are getting therapy for mental health issues. Now, again, I'm not against that. If you need the therapy, get the therapy. That's wise of you. That's a good thing. But why is this needed in such great numbers? I, I'm not criticizing anyone for getting help. I would commend you if you're getting help. That's right. But what's, what's happening is that at ever-increasing rates, at ever-increasing rates, people find it necessary to resort to these treatment modalities. We wonder why. We're doing our best, but we're not getting better. We're trying our hardest, perhaps, but it's apparent that we're not improving. Go to any bookstore or even any online bookstore. Self-help books proliferate. You see, that's the best people can do. The best we can do for each other or for ourselves, by ourselves, is a temporary fix. The very best solution for you that anybody can proffer or provide is at best limited to this world and cannot get you into the world to come. Doctor gives you something that works, praise the Lord. Your treatment was successful, great, but I've got news for you. You're still gonna die. Maybe not real soon, but eventually, unless you are the one exception to the rule, Sorry to break this to you, but I don't think you are. Eventually, you'll be pushing up daisies along with everybody else. See, our solutions in this world aren't real solutions. You recover from injury. You go to the physical therapist. Thank the Lord. You're back on your feet. <laughs> One day you live long enough, you won't be able to walk. It's just how it goes. This world offers us little. We can't get beyond the problems of this world. Just heard today, a colleague of mine, would you pray, my mother has had a massive stroke. That's never good when you know that mom is in her maybe mid-80s. But this is just what happens. Again, this is not me being critical. This is just what happens. 
So if a psychotherapist returns you to the height of your mental and emotional powers, what would that actually be? Would it be something to brag about? Be something to be glad about? But it's not going to get you out of this world and into the world to come. So what about that world to come? How do you get ready for that? That's what we need to be certain about. Can we know? Oh, yes, we can. I want to remind you or show you what God did for for one individual. The man wasn't a bad man as far as people go. If you were to sum him up, you'd probably say, that's a great guy. He was law-abiding, very strict about it. He was very, very dedicated to his religion, and we know that because he tells us. But Saul was off track. He was zealous, but zealously persecuting the early Christian church. His heart wasn't right. Now, let me pause you to ask you a question. Aren't you glad that God doesn't just cut you off when your heart is not right? I mean, Paul was a monster considering uh, from the consideration of people in the church. When he was converted, there were people who were afraid of him, and they didn't believe that he could be right, given all the wrong things that he did before. But God, instead of rejecting Saul, appealed to Saul. And when Saul yielded to God's invitation, a man named Ananias spoke to the apostle Paul. Well, it was Saul, wasn't it? And then he became Paul. And Ananias said this to him. It's Acts chapter 22. We're starting in verse 14. The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Arise and be what? Arise and be baptized. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now that's fascinating. I want to just double back around and make sure you do not miss this. We restore homes and cars and cathedrals and, how, and, and whatever churches, whatever else. It's only temporary. Anyone who offers you improvement in this world, as good as it is, it's only a stay of execution. It's only an improvement. It's only a modification. But here's what God does. God finds the faulty, and we're all faulty, and I tell you, the, well, before he was the apostle, Saul, Saul the Pharisee, he was, he was faulty, persecuting the church, aiding and abetting the deaths of multiplied Christian people. But God found him, arrested him, as it were, and said, I've got a plan for you, I've got a future for you, and in that future, I want you to arise and be baptized. Ananias was merely echoing the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 28 when he said, Matthew 28 starting in verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he said, and lo, I be with you always, even to the end of the age, amen. So why did God tell Paul, be baptized? Why did Jesus recommend to his followers to make disciples of people and baptize them? Well, we find the answer in a discussion had one night, a discussion between Jesus himself and a very important man who came to see Jesus by night so that nobody would see him talking to this this homeschooled rabbi. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, starting in verse 2, wait, Nicodemus said to Jesus, starting in John 3 and verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus wanted to get to the point. He got right past this and spoke to the man's heart in John 3 and verse 3. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus came from this angle. Oh, great miracles, Rabbi. You are the man. Somebody who called this righteousness by flattery. Jesus wasn't buying it. And he told this leader in Israel, man, you've got to be born again. John 3, verse 4. 
Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Of course, this was an absurdity. This was not going to happen. He knew that, but he was shocked. This man is telling me I have to be what? Born again? Perhaps he was wondering what that was, but I don't think so. Because the Jews had a phrase for people who converted to Judaism. They said they were born again. So Jesus was clearly telling Nicodemus that he needed to find a new experience. And he said to him in John 3 and verse 5, Most assuredly, I say to you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, let's start with born of the Spirit. What does that mean? It's a simple concept. It's not difficult to get your head around. This is referring to conversion. Born of the Spirit. The change the Holy Spirit wrought, wrought? The change a Holy Spirit works in a person's life when that person is converted and committed to God, when that person lives a life of faith. It's not a simple thing. It is a radical remaking of a life. It's what God does in someone's experience. The Word of God says this, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a, what? New creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's right. Again, we're not talking about new upholstery and new paint and new parts. We are talking about a new creation. God will make you new. I want you to see how God describes this. When Jesus comes into your life, he makes a new person out of you. You were a failure before, you'll be remade. You did terribly, you did terribly wrong things before, now you're remade. This is what God does. This is what grace does in a person's life. Now, I believe, based on years of experience in this, that part of the problem that we face as human beings is we tend to equate uh, perfect behavior with acceptance. Let me say that again. Part of the problems many people have, or part of the, one of the problems many people have, is that they equate acceptance with God with flawless behavior. And that belies a little misunderstanding. I understand why people think that, but it's wrong. Nothing wrong with flawless behavior. Let me explain. Somebody might come to faith in Jesus and ask Jesus into his or her heart and have a, 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 a special time with God and pray and so on. It's all good. And then minutes later, go outside and yell at the neighbor. And you might think, well, what was all that? You may think the truth is I'm not a real Christian. Jesus didn't take my heart. I'm living a lie. Why waste my time when it's clear that all I am is a hypocrite? I don't want you to answer out loud, but I do want you to reflect on this and ask yourself, if you can relate to that in any way at all. Call yourself a Christian, accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then you go and you feel like a hypocrite. I would suggest that your failure might have much less to do with being a hypocrite and everything to do with something else. Remember the Bible story? It's a parable, actually. Jesus talked about the work of God in a person's life, and he said it was a lot like a seed being planted in the ground. And somehow, the gardener doesn't even know how. It pops up first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear, which of course is a mistranslation. It's really, it's wheat that they had back there, but the, 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 the English translators back then just called it all corn, whether it was wheat or something else. So, what you see is when the seed goes into the ground, the seed dies, and then it begins to grow. That seed doesn't turn into fully mature corn or wheat 
instantaneously. Take some time. Now, while it's growing, it's doing all the right things, you know? At this stage, it's this developed, and this stage, it's this developed, and then you've got ears of corn on a corn stalk. You can't eat them, but they're doing all the right thing. Got the little tassel starting to form. It, it may not be ready to eat, but, it, but it's, it's getting there, you see? It's doing the right thing. And what we fail to realize is that we can be in the right place in our experience. Maybe we haven't made it to the finish line yet, but we're growing. The life of a believer in Jesus is a life of growth. And so you want to be continuing to grow in grace in Jesus. Now, this does not mean it was okay for you to go yell at your neighbor. If that's what you're into, stop and, and stop it right away. That's not good. Doesn't mean it's okay to yell at your family. I'm just using yelling as an example, and I don't know why, but that's what we are right now. You shouldn't yell at your friends and family and neighbors and colleagues. You, you, you just shouldn't. But you've got to remember that everything in this world grows, and growth takes time. If you put seed in the soil and you give it water and enough sunlight and air and the right growing conditions, it's going to grow. It doesn't spring up instantaneously, but it grows. So if you look at your life and you feel like a failure, if you've ever thought, I'm not a real Christian, this is hypocrisy, maybe, maybe I'm better off doing something else, let's not think like that. And let's understand that as you come to Jesus in faith, you grow. You hang on to Jesus and grow. And if you make a mistake, you learn from that mistake. And God doesn't cut you off any more than he cut off the apostle Paul who was assisting materially in the murder of some of God's best and closest friends. So God doesn't cut you off. He's not done with you just because you have demonstrated to the world that you are not the finished product. So you come to Jesus, and in your, in your walk of faith, you are new. You're made new. You're born of the Holy Spirit. That's conversion. Now, I'll tell you what somebody said to me just a couple of days ago. I do want to leave you with a very balanced understanding of this, if I can. He said, before I came to Jesus, he said, I was a real rascal. But I came to faith in Christ. He said, there were things that I wanted to do once upon a time. He said, but who knew the Holy Spirit would come and speak to my heart? And I found that I didn't want to do those things that I once wanted to do. And I found that I wanted to do things that before held no attraction. So you see what happens? Some things God will just take away right out of your life, just like that. Not everything. Some things takes a, a, take a bit of growing, and we want to hang in there with God. So born of the Spirit is conversion. You come to Jesus, he gives you a new mind, he gives you a new heart, and then as a baby believer, you begin to grow, and you keep on growing all the way to the kingdom of heaven. What about born of water? That's the easy one. This is water baptism. That's the sign of having your sins washed away. This is why Paul wrote in the, in the book of Romans, chapter 6 and starting in verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Here's the beauty of the Christian experience. When you come to God in faith, the old you dies. And a new you comes out of the water of baptism to walk in newness of life. It's a new you, and you have a new experience. Baptism is a symbol of your old life dying and a new you being raised from the dead to live a new life. That's what baptism's about. It's hard to understand why it is that the subject of baptism becomes so confused. Writing to the, to the Ephesians, Paul said that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one method of baptism. That's just the way it is. You see this in Jesus' experience. It's, it's very plain to understand. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the River Jordan to be baptized by John. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, 
and you are coming to me? Ah, but Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John the Baptist, allowed him, Jesus. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We notice several things. One, Jesus was baptized where there was a lot of water. It was a river, the River Jordan. And second, we notice that God was well pleased. His son was baptized and God was well pleased. I understand that ever so slightly. When my own children were baptized in the River Jordan, actually, I was well pleased. What a thrill to know that they'd given their hearts to Jesus in baptism. John wrote the reason Jesus was baptized where he was baptized was because there was much water there. John 3, verse 23. Now, baptism, if you keep your eyes open, you see it popping up again and again in the Bible. Now, Philip met a man from Ethiopia riding in a chariot. The story says this, starting in Acts 8, verse 36. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch, the Ethiopian man, said, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Notice, notice the threshold there. If you believe with all your heart. Now, that's going to look like something, ladies and gentlemen. The guy leaning against the bar, drunk out of his mind, uh, can say that he believes with all of his heart, but I think there's something lacking there, and you might agree. But it's a pretty simple equation. If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he, Philip, baptized the man from Ethiopia. I want you to notice they went down into the water. They didn't grab a cup of water and baptize the fellow on the side of the road. They went into the water where there was adequate H2O. Acts 8 verse 39 goes on to say this. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Notice before God was pleased, and now the Ethiopian man is pleased. There is joy all the way around when somebody comes to faith in God and is baptized. We understand this very easy. The word baptize means to immerse. It's from the Greek word baptizo. It means to, to plunge all the way under. If it's not immersion, it's not baptism. It's something else. Now, when I was about this big, I was christened. The priest poured some water on my head. It wasn't baptism. It was christening. If it isn't immersion, it isn't baptism. And it's really important we understand that because Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. No, baptism doesn't save you, but it is an act of faith. And faith is what saves an individual through Jesus. It is the response of an obedient and loving heart to the Savior, which says, I am willing to follow you. You see, if Jesus says, it is my will that you're baptized, and you say, it ain't going to happen, not going to do it, then of course we are questioning the depth and the veracity of your Christian experience. So you believe and you're baptized, you're saved. You see, Jesus brought together two very important things. One, belief. That's what happens inwardly. And then the demonstration of that belief, which is what happens outwardly. That's the water baptism. It's much like a wedding. You can say you love somebody, but if you just get around without ever saying, I do, then there's no real evidence that you actually do. The wedding ceremony is what makes this official. It's your witness to one another and to the world that you are uh, experiencing a permanent love and you are making a commitment. In baptism, you make a commitment, but more than that, you are accepting the commitment that Jesus made to you when he died out there on the old rugged cross. 
Baptism is renewal. Your sins are washed away. You are made new and clean. Again, not renovated. This has nothing to do with a coat of paint and new ceiling tiles, replaced cabinets, and some new faucets. That's home improvement. This is recreation. That's what Jesus does. Out with the old, in with the new. And you can say with Paul, who wrote to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith or by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what you get to say when you give your heart to Jesus. And when you've been baptized, you've been put to death. You have died. Thank the Lord we didn't leave you in the water. Raised you up to walk in newness of life. You are saying, God, I'm with you. I'm on your side. I accept. And what you're doing in baptism is you are not saying, I am a super Christian. I am strong enough. I can do this. Baptism is actually a confession of your weakness and of your absolute abject need of the strength of Jesus. And you remember that God says that his strength is made perfect in weakness. So don't be one of these people. Oh, I think I'm ready. I think I'm good enough. I can do this. I'm strong enough. I will never let God down. A lady in Paris, France said to me one day, Pastor, I cannot be baptized. And I said, well, you had made a decision to be baptized, so what has changed? She said, I am absolutely worried that after I'm baptized, I will sin. And I said, I'm not worried at all. She looked at me, and I said, I will guarantee you that you will sin after you're baptized. Now, this was not what she was expecting to hear. I said, no, I don't want you to sin, and I don't think Jesus wants you to sin. I think you want to sin. No, she did not want to sin. I explained to her that a person is baptized because that person needs Jesus, not because you've arrived at some level where you can do it on your own now. She understood baptism was not a profession of her strength. It was an admission of her weakness and a statement of her absolute need of Jesus in her life. She was baptized, and she entered into a thriving, beautiful Christian experience. So we need to understand this very carefully, you understand. If, like me, you have wondered why today there are so many different methods of baptism in the church, I'm about to tell you. You will find people baptized by immersion. You'll find people baptized with oil. I saw somebody baptized in rose petals. No, I read about that. I saw a whole church full of people baptized by the fire department. No joke. They showed up at the parking lot of the church, turned on their fire hoses and sprayed everybody down. Charlotte, North Carolina. People were so happy they were dancing in the parking lot, waving their hands, they'd been baptized. Well, they hadn't. They got soaked. Could have got their neighbor to do it with a super soaker. Would have been just as, as, as legitimate. How in the world? You know what's interesting is if you go to old cathedrals in Europe, you'll discover that in many or even most perhaps of these cathedrals, they once used to baptize by immersion. They did. In churches today, or which today gave up on baptism by immersion years ago, but they used to baptize by immersion. If you were to visit the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know, you know what the Leaning Tower of Pisa is, right? It's a bell tower at a cathedral complex. So right there in the cathedral complex, you will find there a baptistry where not too terribly long ago, people used to be baptized by immersion. It's right there. If you ever walked past it at the Leaning Tower of Pisa, I hope you wondered Why is there a great big pool here that looks a lot like something a person ought to be baptized in? That's because right there at that Roman Catholic cathedral complex, people were once upon a long ago baptized by immersion. They're not today, but they were once. It wasn't until the 14th century 
that the church declared that sprinkling was just as valid as a way of baptism as was immersion. Until then, immersion. Let me show you this quote from a book called Faith of Our Fathers. For several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was usually conferred by immersion. But since the 12th century, the practice of baptizing by infusion has prevailed in the Catholic Church, as this manner is attended with, notice this, less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. Now, I don't need to point out to you that it becomes a little bit of a problem when we start consulting our convenience and using that as the reason we do thus and so in the service of God. There was another reason too, and that is because the erroneous teaching of original sin came into the church. The teaching that little babies were born actually guilty of sin. The Bible would teach that a little baby is born bent, uh, 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 fallen, sure, no question about it, but a newborn isn't guilty of sin. You've got to understand what you're doing for it to be sin. You've got to have some participation, some agency in this thing. So the church began to teach that in order for a, ch uh, for a child to avoid dying with sin on his or her soul, yeah, that's a misstatement again, you want to wash that sin away so that should the baby die, the baby can go to heaven. Wow. All the errors, they're just stacking up on each other, aren't they? So that was the teaching. Of course, not the least bit biblical. They thought if we just sprinkle a little bit of water on this baby's head, then should the baby die, the baby's going to be okay. I remember my own father being terribly worried about my brother's daughter. Have you had that child baptized? No, Dad, I haven't. What will happen if the child dies? Well, we, I don't know. You don't want the child to go to limbo. You do want the child to go to heaven. You need to have the child baptized. I don't know if he ever did or not, but whether he did or otherwise, it wouldn't have made a bit of difference. You know that before a person is baptized, imagine, imagine, imagine carrying a child to the church, saying to the priest, would you? The child is either sitting there calmly or crying or, or, or fussing, and now the child has had a faith experience. <laughs> That's ludicrous, isn't it? Poor kid did not know what was going on, and now you ascribe to it some measure of grace or Christian growth or advancement on some level. Ludicrous. I mean, I mean look, I mean no offense, but I, it's ludicrous if you can say that and not be offensive. Uh, certainly not biblical. So before a person is baptized by water, let me suggest three things that a person might want to do. The first one would be repent. How do we know this? Because it says in the Bible in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance. You confess with your mouth, and then repentance, you turn away from sin. You've embraced God with your life, your mind, your heart, your being. And then after you repent, you want to believe. That's important. Believe. I think unthinkable that one might repent without believing, but perhaps it happens. You would believe. You know, Paul told the jail keeper in Philippi, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. So you repent and then you believe and then there's something else you ought to do and that is follow. That's walk in the footsteps of Jesus. That's have a converted experience. That's not fight against God. That is surrender to God. Back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, remember what it says? Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. A disciple is a follower. You choose to follow Jesus, you would follow Jesus in baptism. This isn't something that babies would participate in. Baptism is a personal decision made by somebody who has, has had the ability and the opportunity to make a choice. What you do with babies is do what we did with ours. You take the baby to the church or some similar place, and that baby is dedicated. Jesus was dedicated. And in that action, the parents dedicate themselves to raising the child in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and that is the right thing to do. A person who is baptized is assured their sins are forgiven. The Spirit of God comes into your heart. You become part of the family of God by adoption. Isn't that great? 
Just a day or so ago, I was at a, I was at a funeral for a, a dear friend. And uh, his two children were there, both adopted. Uh, the mother jokes about going to the store to pick them out, pick them, pick them off the shelf or something like that. And the, the daughter, a, a grown woman with a granddaughter of her own, spoke and said, I always felt so special because my parents chose me. They picked me. They chose me. She said, it always made me feel so special. We're adopted. God chose you, picked you, selected you. Baptism is like a new beginning with God. I mentioned before, it's just like marriage unites uh, two people together and, and they live a, a life together, uh, a life in which they grow together in spite of their incompleteness. <laughs> people who say, I don't feel like I'm good enough to be baptized. I never heard you say to your spouse, I don't feel like I'm good enough to be married. Come on now, be consistent. You choose Jesus and you enter into a relationship with him and you grow. He takes your heart, the old you is buried, and a new you is raised up to live a completely new life. That's baptism. You can't get that new life any other way. Your sin is washed away just like Naaman's leprosy was washed away in the River Jordan. Fascinating, isn't it? Naaman was cleansed in the Jordan. Jesus cleansed in the Jordan. God's trying to get something through to us here. Leprosy represents sin. Sin is to be washed away. Oh, thank God. If you had a debt, you might have to try to pay it off. And maybe you can and maybe you cannot. Maybe you've got to declare bankruptcy. Let me tell you, when it comes to your sin, you've got to declare bankruptcy. This is not castigation or criticism. It's just the reality. All of us are sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. If we were to try to repay God for the sin we've committed, we could never do it in a thousand lifetimes, not even a million. But God says, I'll just wash all that sin away, and I will make a brand new you. Baptism, outward, it's something you do, you go through. Why? So you will know forever that you have a new starting point or had one. You can know forever, reborn, born of the Spirit. That's when I accepted Jesus. I was converted, given a new mind, new heart, Spirit of God into my life. Born of water, water baptism. And so today, irrespective of how good or bad my day might have been, I can go all the way back to that day when I was standing in a, in a pool in an upper room in London, England. I still remember that. I remember what it felt like when the water closed over my face. It felt great. And I went down into that water, and in my mind, I was thinking something like, this is real, this is new, I've accepted Jesus. My life changes now. I'm a Christian, I'm a follower. I've got to walk with Jesus now. I love to tell you I've never put a foot wrong, but I can't tell you that. But I can tell you that my life was united with Jesus and he never dropped me, never gave up on me, never told me to go away, never turned his back on me. And I can go right back to that day and know that from then on, my life began all over again. You know, sometimes it can be Hard to start again. You make mistakes in life. It happens. In relationships, mistakes are made. In marriages, colossal damage can be done that can sometimes never be undone. People get into financial trouble, financial ruin, bankruptcy. What do you do if you tarnish your reputation? If someone slights or slurs or, or slanders you, how do you get it back? And what do you do about that stuff in your life? You ever hear people say, I don't know if I can forgive myself for what I've done. You ever hear that? You've heard that. You've heard that. Well, that's Christian psychobabble. It, it means nothing. Because you don't have to forgive yourself for what you've done. <laughs> Who made you God? God does the forgiving, not you. I know what you mean, though. You mean, man, I, I, I backed over my neighbor's geraniums. Oh, man, it was a prized geranium. She poured her whole life into that. She was going to take them to the, to, the, to the summer fair, the county fair, and win her first prize. What if you had backed over your neighbor's child? What if you did that?
you did that? How could you live with yourself if you did that? How could you ever forgive yourself if you did that? Well, I mean, you couldn't forgive yourself. I think what a person means is, how could I ever find peace within myself if I did that? I read the other day about a a business executive, well-known man, not a household name, but a big deal position with a very big company. And he's written a book about his life, and so now's the time to tell the story that when he was 16 years old, he shot a boy dead. It was in cold blood. He got angry about something. He went out looking for trouble. He was going to find the guy who did what he did and fix him, but instead he just shot the first person he saw. Completely innocent kid. Shot him dead. He was arrested, went to jail for some time, got out of jail, rebuilt his life. He said, it's always bothered me. Of course it has. How do you find peace? Well, if you do something terrible, there's always going to be something inside you that won't feel quite right, and that's appropriate. You can't forgive yourself. You know what you can do, though? You can know that God forgives you. Doesn't make it right, but it makes something right out of whatever was wrong. God forgives you. You screwed up a family, a relationship, a a, a business, you stole from somebody, you ruined somebody, you killed somebody. You can't undo that. But you can know that God forgives you. And you can know when you go down into the waters of baptism, all that is washed away. You might come up out of the waters of baptism and say, I remember that, I still feel bad. But you can say, but I'm clean. But I'm forgiven. But I'm new. And I'm absolutely 100% completely and totally right with God. Some things are impossible for you to fix. God can fix it. God can make you new, and he wants to, and he's waiting to. This is why we read earlier, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if any person be in Christ, he is, she is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I love what God said through the prophet Isaiah when he wrote, I will do a new thing, Isaiah 43, 19. That's what God does. Paul wrote that God makes a new person out of you and Jesus, out of you and Jesus, of the two, making one new person. Because when you're in Jesus, you're new, and baptism is the sign of that. That's the sign of that. Romans 8, verse 1, some of the most profound words in the history of literature. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, she's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Read this with me, please. Let's read it. Behold, all things are... How many things? All things have become what? That's when Jesus enters your heart. God says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Not enough for some people. Saved by grace through faith. Not enough for some people. Too easy. You can have eternal life simply by accepting what I've done for you, God says. Oh, it can't be that easy. I want to make a pilgrimage or pay some money or do some penance. No. None of that will do. None of that will do. Not now, not ever. Just believe and you can know that Jesus died to give you a new heart and a new life. Too simple for some people. You want to make it harder. You want to work for it. You want it to be difficult. You got to feel like you deserve it. Nope. Just accept the gift. Jesus already did the hard part. He died on a cross. And now he wants you to live a new life through faith in him. Can you exercise saving faith right now? I want to give you the opportunity to do so. Easiest thing you've ever done. If you've never been baptized, now's the time to make a decision. Yes, I must be baptized. If you feel in your heart that for some reason you are to be re-baptized, and that's biblical in certain circumstances, then you can say, yes, Lord, count me in. Maybe you want to say in your heart, I want to prepare for baptism sometime, don't know when, but this is the road I'm on. I want to give you the opportunity to follow Jesus in faith tonight. 
My number is 71392. Send me the message renew. We'll send you a link. Click on that link so that you too with us here in this place can make a decision for Jesus right now. You know something? I was driving in a car once. The pastor was in the front seat. His wife was in the seat next to him. There were three of us, maybe four of us in the back. We'd been to the seaside. I was living in England. Somehow, very conveniently, I'm sure, the subject got around to baptism. And somebody said to me, John, have you been baptized? And I said, no. And they said, why not? And I said, no one's ever asked me. The pastor said, I was waiting for you to ask me. Something switched in my mind right there. And I knew from that moment on, I would never make the mistake of waiting for someone to ask me. So I'm asking you, 71392, if you're watching at three o'clock in the morning, I promise you, I'll text you right back. I will answer your text message. 71392, send me the word renew and I will send you back a link. You click that link and you can make a decision as well. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, don't wait. Let's pray together. Let's pray right now, Father in heaven, We need to talk to you. Made some decisions here tonight. All over the world, decisions have been made. I do feel like I need to pray for that one individual who opted not to make a decision. She thought, this can wait. He thought, ah, I'm not ready to change. I'm not prepared to surrender. So please, Lord, continue to speak to those hearts. Speak to those hearts. Draw them. Convince them that you truly are a God of love and your way is the very best way. And for each person who's made a decision for you tonight, Lord, we say thank you and we pray that you draw near that one. Encourage that dear heart and keep that person's mind fixed on yours, their eyes in the direction of heaven, their faith up your heart open to the impress of your spirit. Thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. We love you. We praise you. We pray together in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen and amen.